What's up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Asia Rugby Live Real Talk, Real Rugby where we talk to people from all over the world of course about rugby and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to Asia Rugby Live and hit on the bell button so you will receive any notification from us should there be any uh, new uh, news or uh, new content from our site. So yeah, please hit that subscribe and uh, bell button. Uh, and also, don't forget to log on to www.asiarugby.com for your latest uh, news and rugby updates. Uh, and I would like to, uh, what do you call that, uh, update everyone on the latest news of Asia Rugby and also what's happening around the world. Thailand returns to rugby with a rugby a roadshow, rugby on tour clinic. So that is interesting where... Former uh, All Black Sevens, Lotte Rai Kambula is involved. He is also the head coach of a Thailand Sevens team. And Kazakhstan woman is aiming for a uh, Rugby World Cup return. So that would be interesting to have, you know, a uh, another Asia representative in the Rugby World Cup. And uh, the last rugby news I would like to update everyone is qualification process set for Rugby World Cup 2023. So for Asia, the winner of the Asia Rugby Men's Championship 2021 will play Ocean Oceania 2 home and away. The winner on aggregate will determine the qualifier and the loser will go to final qualification Asia slash Pacific one. So that should be interesting that uh, I, I'm so looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully there will be another representative from Asia apart from Japan uh, who is who are already representing Asia in the Rugby World Cup. And of course, today we are talking about uh, player welfare. So we have three uh, guests today. One of the guests has been on the show, but I want to introduce the only woman uh, who, who is on the show today, Lucy Clark from Hong Kong. Lucy, how are you doing, Lucy? Good to see you on the show. Hi, thank you. Yes, very well, thank you. We've got nice, hot, sunny weather in Hong Kong, of course. Um, looking forward to talking about player welfare. Uh, great. Uh, and you know, I've spoken to you just now and I'm looking forward for some uh, good sharing session. Uh, the second person I would like to introduce is a good friend of mine, Dr. Azrael Ali, who has been, you know, involved with rugby and me medical rugby in Malaysia for quite some time. Doc, how are you doing, man? Hi, hi. Hi there, Rod. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the show. I'm glad to share uh, some experience uh, that can be used uh, for the viewers to go through this path in uh, Play Welfare. Good man. Looking forward for your, uh, you know, for your views and thoughts on on this matter, Play Welfare, as you are the only doctor, medical doctor, uh, in the panel. And last but not least, uh, our favorite man, the boss, Benjamin Van Royen. <laughs> Benjamin, who is back in Dubai. Ben, how are you doing, man? Are you enjoying the weather in Dubai? <laughs> Hello, Rod. Yes, um, and it's good to see you again. Yes, and now this time I'm seeing you from Dubai. Um, yeah, to answer your question, how, how's the weather? Well. At night, it does dip all the way to 33 uh, as a minimum. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we're surviving. Oh, that's good. That's good. And hopefully you will enjoy uh, the weather in Dubai rather than you've been enjoying the weather in Wales and the UK for the past, what, three months? So yes. <laughs> that, yes. that's, that's a different uh, environment for you. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. At least 20 degrees difference, yeah, on average. So, guys... We'll be talking about uh, you know player welfare and of course this issue is uh, is something that has always uh, spoken about and to me personally it's never enough uh, it's never enough in terms of yes there's always something new to talk about every year there's always something to update everyone every year so which is a good thing for medical and also player welfare so I would like to uh, you know ask everyone uh, uh, probably we can start with Lucy first Lucy what's your What's your involvement uh, in terms of player welfare for Asia Rugby? So for, for Asia Rugby, uh, I sit on the Player Welfare Medical Committee, which was a committee that actually was set up way back in, I think, 2013. 
um, under the auspices of, of Dr. David Owens actually set that up. Um, and it's since been um, taken over as a lead by Dr. Matsuo Yamada from Japan. Um, and my role, uh, uh, other than being a one of the regional uh, leads for um, East Asia, is uh, head of the concussion working group and lead for the recent specialist COVID-19 working group. Cool. How about uh, you, Dr. Azriel? How's, how's your involvement with uh, medical and rugby uh, generally? Um, I'm a sports doctor working in the National Sports Institute of Malaysia. Uh, we take care of uh, athletes going for Olympics and uh, other major sports. Um, I'm also supporting uh, Malaysia rugby setting as a former director of the medical and player welfare and currently serving them as a consultant advisor. Um, still pretty much active, working as a team doctor for the recent Global Rugby 2020 as a team doctor for Malaysia Falker. Um, in Asia Rugby, I'm a member of the med medical committee since 2015. My role is uh, overseeing the medical competition uh, area and I'm also the area lead for Southeast Asia. Uh, just uh, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Azriel was also involved with the Japan uh, Rugby World Cup team in the recent Rugby World Cup, which is, I, I am so proud of you, Dr. Azriel. So, yeah, you're cool, man. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, the only person that is not involved directly with medical or phys, uh, physio, uh, physio is uh, Ben. But Ben has also an important role in player welfare. Can you take us through uh, your role in, in, in this particular area, Ben? Um, yes, yes, Rod. So, so my job is um, to look after development across Asia. And um, in our structure, we have a development committee. And under the development committee falls everything that's got to do with rugby development, which includes training and education. Um, so we're fortunate to have a very good training and education manager in Asia Rugby. So development, training and education work together. But on, on grassroots level, I think my role and the role of, of everybody involved in, in development is to, to take the messages that we get from the professionals like Lucy and, and Asriel, to take that and put it in, in digestible normal man's language so whenever we do training and education when whenever we do development we make sure that that people do understand that that what the best practices are and um, it's a continuous process um, but to be honest with you the, the standards we've just raised the standards over over the last couple of years so well so um, i think um, still a lot of work to do but we are on, on a on a good track here in in asia rugby is is one of the challenges, Ben, in terms of educating people is language. Uh, would would you reckon that's one of the uh, big hurdles? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I think you know even even in basic um, coach education, language can be a problem sometimes. As you know, in most languages, the word line out and scrum cannot really be translated. So imagine how difficult it is to to have it in you know, to have medical technical terms, rugby related technical terms into a, into a foreign language. So in terms of training and education, yes, um, Asia Rugby is working in sub regions and they're making sure that people are actually educated in English so that they can deliver the content in their own languages. Um, yeah, you're right. Rug, um, language, language can be a challenge. But we, we do have a lot of people around around Asia now, you know, you know that 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 can translate for their own rugby communities. Yes, yes, for sure. And yeah. I reckon Lucy and uh, Dr. Azriel has some uh, stories that you guys can share from from past experiences in educating and also as an educator trainer uh, for you know world rugby uh, ed medical courses. But I, I wanna I wanna talk through. The involvement uh, history of you guys, uh, Lucy. Can you can you you know share with us how do you get involved with uh, you know um, physio and and rugby? Yeah, sure. So my current role uh, as a senior manager for player welfare and medical for Hong Kong rugby um, is quite interesting. It's quite a diverse role. 
Um, player welfare essentially covers anything that affects the physical or mental well-being uh, of, of, of people. So it, in, it encompasses both education and clinical skills required to to really take care of everything from our mini rugby players in the community all the way through to our full-time elite athletes and then of course we have to take care of the carers so uh there's it really it is a is a very diverse role which which is which is fantastic um I, you know i love it um in addition to that i'm part of the senior leadership team for hong kong rugby and that involves us discussing and planning our strategies, our policies across the entire scope of Hong Kong rugby. So that involves the commercial department, the financial department, the performance department, community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it really is a very, very diverse role. Um, how did I get involved with it? Well, again, that is a little bit unusual. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor or physio. I'm a nurse. Come from a nursing background. I came from a medical education background, I guess. Um, and essentially through that, I was invited along to a rugby game quite some time ago now. It was an Asia Pacific game and I was asked to come and help with the first aid. Um, there were a few injuries to, to, to manage on the day, but my overriding memory really was everybody I came across was so passionate yet so respectful and inclusive that I just thought, this is, this is fantastic. I want to do more of this. So I soon became a regular on the sidelines. And of course, what well, didn't take me long to encourage or invite some of my colleagues, my colleague first aiders, and some of them were doctors, some of them were nurses, some of them were um, fire guys, you know, um, paramedics, et cetera, et cetera. They soon joined us. Um, and I've been 30 years now, pretty much, I have to say, in Hong Kong, and 25 of those probably at least has been involved with rugby. Um, and I think, as I said, for, for me as a nurse, so not a doctor, not a physio, so I'm, I'm, I'm unusual in terms of, you know, getting into sport. Um, and also, again, the medical um, environment, tends, 30, certainly 30 years ago, tended to be more male-oriented. The rugby environment tended to be more male-oriented. But I never really gave it a second thought. And I, as I say, I was really able to grow and develop in my role uh, I'm fully supported and I thought it was fantastic and so my passion really has been to try and get other people like-minded people no matter what their background to get involved because everybody basically can do something to help player welfare uh, and that that's really kind of where I came from and and where I got I've done I think something like 22 or 23 Hong Kong sevens um, and uh, many 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 other opportunities um, throughout Asia and throughout the world, actually, through through my involvement here in rugby. So it's been a fantastic experience. And of course, your experience as a nurse uh, does help, uh, you know, help you in your line of work. Yes, absolutely. I think um, in, as, as nurses, we're, we're, we're used to multitasking, we're used to managing, we're used to um, really doing the sort of uh, well, taking care of people, I suppose, with carers naturally. So with support from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. David Owens, and he's, he's, he's really been my mentor. He's been absolutely fantastic, always supportive. Uh, I've got, you know, colleagues like Azrael, Matsuo on the Asia rugby side now as well, who are equally um, as supportive. So that uh, really we're able to, to, to do and to function what, what we need to do uh, in order to put policies and protocols in, into place. Dr. Ajit. Dr. Ajit, sorry, I think sorry about that. There's some technical issue anyway. <laughs> Dr. Ajit, you've been, you've been involved in, uh, the, the first time we crossed paths uh, was in Sri Lanka, uh, 2013 or 2014, uh, a few years ago, when uh, you you were the team doctor for the Malaysian under 19 side and after that, that you you never stopped in in uh, developing your your career path into becoming a medical doctor was that the first time that you were involved in um rugby medical and can you take us through how did you get involved after that uh thank you rod um i think it was a combination of uh, luck uh, and uh, commitment and opportunity um, as you know that uh, I 
um, invested my time in athletes care as I involved in my master's training in sports medicine. And that makes me wanted to take care of the playing athletes. Uh, being there at the field feels like uh, being thrown into the lion's dance when you see a big guys playing rugby, crush into each other, collided into each other, wreck each other and survive. They are big and they keep getting up even though they hit their heads or they might injure their neck. And I have a good mentors that uh, train me along and then the passion actually grew. As you can see, all actions happen on the field and uh, when you are there at the ground taking care of these players, um, you have to show them a good performance in managing injuries and that overall will make a good system. And through the years of practice, I think a good system comes to the medical training from World Rugby. So you are entering a basic level one first aid to start with because that is how a, uh, someone can help an injured player. And then you can advance uh, through um, a more advanced training for immediate care beside usually by the medical trained people such as the doctors and the paramedics. And then, of course, you have to put this into a good system and share it with many people so that everyone will be um, part of the team to take care of the players. Uh, of course, uh, as in the DNA, I'm a doctor. My first interest is, of course, protecting the players. But I also, like Lucy, wearing so many hats. Um, I'm a trainer. Um, in order to help people to understand the skills. I'm also, um, of course, a rugby fan. That's why I still stay on, on the field. Um, meet many people involved with um, many tournaments until today. So I can say that it's a well-vested uh, uh, interest and I hope uh, we will see more people. And in fact, uh, we'll, we have uh, establish a medical teams, uh, be it in Malaysia or in South Asia, in across Asia, through the efforts uh, by the Asia Rugby Medical Committee and uh, getting the momentum from the competition that we have uh, for the past many uh, years. So I hope to see uh, more Lucy and Azrael and Musso Yamada and many more people who have been there around in the picture developing the games. And the thing is, you, you, Azri, you have been training a few uh, medical doctors in Malaysia to be the next, uh, you know, Dr. Azriel. So how is that working out for you? You have a few understudies under you, right? Um, it was uh, a fruitful journey uh, to take new people under your wings and I'm very proud of them. Um, I can uh, name them by uh, their involvements and we have a, a, a medical director, Dr. Nick, we have a team doctor, Dr. Hazwan, and of course the training education doctors to assist me, Dr. Wazin. These uh, people was with me from the beginning. They endure a lot of hardship. Um, we are not getting paid much, but because of the passion we stayed on, and we like to improve a lot of the system and be thankful to many people that cooperate and give us support. Yeah, I know. I, I, the thing is, yes, I know you guys are very passionate because some of the doctors even fork out their own money to buy uh, some medicines for the players and stuff. So I, th I, I commend you guys for that and uh, you guys are doing a great job. Anyway, moving along, uh, I, I think we, we, we need to touch a little bit on COVID-19 since, you know, World Rugby, they, they produce a guideline for uh, COVID-19 return to play and stuff like that. I think, Ben, you can, you can talk about uh, that, how Asia Rugby will take this uh, forward. Um, yes, Rod, I mean, COVID-19 is, is such a con complex concept for us to understand. Um, so we, we, we can't just go out to unions and say, this is what we want you to do. So um, on, on, on the grassroots level, I would say unions are dependent on, on Asia Rugby's um, guidelines. 
Asia Rugby leadership and management, they depended on, on the inputs from our medical player welfare and medical committee. Play, player welfare and medical committee, and I'm sure Lucy and Azrael can, can t talk more about this, they depended on, on the guidelines from World Rugby. So basically down the line, what we're doing is, we firstly, we acknowledge that every, every country, every union has its own regulations in terms of return to play and what do we do for COVID at, at, at the moment. So from the top down, World Rugby give us guidelines. We have our own med player welfare and medical committee, which they are advising our leadership and our management and say this this is what we what we think is the best for for a for, for Asia rugby rugby unions. But then on the other hand, you know, the rules are different. So um, I think you mentioned in, in your intro you know the fact that that there's there's um, a, a tour of of coaches, a, a whole busload of coaches, going out in Thailand and 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 training, training new coaches on 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 all four strands of of, of coaching, and um, strength and conditioning and medical and and match, match officiating. So yeah, so that's an example. I also know that you know in Chinese Taipei and Hong Kong and Singapore and UAE that that they they've started training again. So I think from our side is we, we would say first go and check what, what, what are the regulations of your country and then follow the guidelines the, 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 that are very much based on logic from, from World Rugby. Follow the guidelines from World Rugby, follow the guidelines from Asia Rugby, a medical committee, and then yes, just 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 um, just start with the moment that you get the green light, start to play. Um, and, and of course, it's not going to be the, the, the same. You can't start to train at the same intensity. So there is a return, some return to play protocols where we would encourage, um, you know, coaches not to, not to expect the same from from their players. Um, I just want to mention, you know, it's, it's this COVID nineteen still is and and, and has been a, a quite a life changer for many things. So we're working with with our safeguarding partner, which is um, is Child Fund Pass It Back. And they they have trialed a, a program which they call Reconnect, which is totally on on it's not on the physical side of rugby, but it's more on the emotional side where they actually go to 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 young people and and and, and remind young people again of, of the importance of good communication, um, the importance or the the, the value of of a, of a team sport and things like like that and um, good routines now that people can get get more control of their own routines and then of course basic hygiene so um i think that's that's our job at, at, at ground levels just to make sure that people people can get into the game in a, in a sensible way uh, uh probably lucy can add on to that lucy you, you just now we were talking about this uh you know covid 19 as uh as a new thing is a sensitive issue it's uh something that is unprecedented but Asia Rugby is obviously uh, working on a guideline, working on a framework uh, for return to rugby. Can, can you take a in terms of the framework uh, that you guys are working at right now? Where are you guys at? Yeah, so I think the, the, the role of Asia Rugby Medcom or the COVID working group um, specifically, which, which um, uh, I'm on with. So we have representatives from um, Singapore, from South Korea, from Japan, from Hong Kong and from UAE. And our role really has been to gather data from all the unions in Asia to see what stage that stages they're at in, ter in terms of the, the, the COVID. Um, and also again, with, with, and this was is with, with review to uh, social distancing, uh, density of, of people gathering in groups, travel restrictions, that kind of thing. By being able to gather all that information, we're then able to see which areas are more more able to open up. Um, for example, you know, Vietnam has, has, done, uh, has done a really good job there opening up, as uh, Ben mentioned, um, Thailand is, et cetera, et cetera. So what we can do is we can gather that information and then provide the overall picture to the operations, you know, um, and competitions um, teams uh, so that they can to help them to make a decision as to, to to what is done and when it's done. 
the fantastic we've had uh, regular and, and frequent updates from World Rugby, who of course are gathering. Um, I think they've, they've they've gathered from 76 unions the information that they then share with us, and they've got some fantastic um, research guys, Ross Tucker, who leads up that, who manages to take all this complicated information and put it into um, in, in, in into visuals that we can understand, and that's helped us because we're able to share resources and through the network that we've got through Asia Rugby Medcom we can not only gather all the information but we can then spread out information and we can share it etc and as I say ultimately we can then put forward the information that we've gathered through to the other teams who are trying to work on getting competitions up up and you know rugby up and running um, I think it's important not to get too tied up in in the details. At the end of the day, infection prevention has been around for for a long time, and we still have to look look to the the basic steps. There's, there's almost nothing new in that. Um, it, it we perhaps have, have reviewed our, as as Asra said, we've reviewed our uh, infection prevention protocols to make sure that we, we we try essentially to to assess the risk and then to mitigate the risk by having as much in place as possible when areas are able to return to rugby to ensure that they, they're able to do it as safely as possible so that the, the players are, are in a, a safe environment, as are all the surrounding teams, the managers, the coaches, and when it comes to it, the spectators, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that really has been our role um, over the last several several weeks. Uh, Dr. Azri, um Talking, talking about that, talking about the COVID-19 framework, uh, talking about the the guidelines of COVID-19 on a return to rugby and stuff. You, as a medical doctor, I've always sp uh, spoken to you last time and you've always said your views. If you're unsure or if there's no medical or scientific uh, research that has been done, you won't uh, comment much on it. So in terms of COVID-19, like I said, just now, it is unprecedented. Do you think these guidelines would be enough uh, to you know, prevent further um, contamination and further contact of COVID-19 uh, transmission to, to others? Uh, in my opinion, uh, the existing uh, guidelines help uh, to mitigate some of the risks uh, provide awareness and education, which is very important. Uh, the basic uh, part of this is uh, self uh, skill to protect uh, own self. They have to make sure uh, they instill the culture into their behavior, into their daily activities. A simple um, uh, culture of uh, wash your hands. Um, and for this, you got to make sure you keep safe distance and use uh, personal protection equipment uh, and embrace that as a new normal. Um, despite having uh, uncertainty about the new COVID-19, we have to be ready at all time and protect ourselves um, uh, at all time. And now we are getting into the new normal environment of uh, remote training, uh, isolation uh, training, and uh, also uh, the uh, setbacks of a long uh, restriction period uh, to the performance of physical performance of a players, which we know that if you're unfit, you tend to get injured. And I, in my practice, in my daily clinic, I already receive uh, injury complaint from uh, athletes who train under the supervision of the coach through videos. Uh, so therefore, it become a challenge uh, to get used to the new uh, normal. Nevertheless, uh, I believe the guideline has been prepared by those who are experts and we have to give them credits and these are coming from the frontliners. So we would like to uh, use the guidelines to guide us in getting back uh, in our game. Uh, I think I'm going to uh, stop talking about COVID-19 as you guys will agree this. If we talk about this, we won't finish until tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving along. Um, I want to talk about the Rugby World Cup, uh, last year's Rugby World Cup, uh, the involvement of you, Dr. Azriel. Uh, it must be an unforgettable experience for you, definitely, right? 
Um, Ron, I did uh, mention to you in our last uh, session together last year, uh, it was truly a one in a lifetime experience and my heartfelt thanks to the Asia Rugby uh, and also the medical committee, the World Rugby and the Rugby World Cup uh, 2019 organizer that actually made a dream a reality. For me, a doctor from Malaysia, uh, to be able to be with the big guns in the the most prestigious tournament of world rugby, uh, of rugby, which is the Rugby World Cup in Japan, was really something uh, out of the world. Uh, but uh, don't underestimate the preparation that we did uh, for the moment. There, we it started back in 2009, uh, 2015. Uh, when we had to help Japan to prepare as the host union. I was there uh, together with Lucy as the staff member to support uh, the training and education for pitch sites, uh, immediate care for the Japanese medical team. And then more work was done following years uh, with the Asia Rugby Medcom and also with the uh, Japan Rugby Football Union before we finalized the process last year. As you can see, uh, the World Rugby has uh, organized an uh, independent match day doctor training uh, that led by Dr. Andy Smith. The program was instrumental to the preparation for the game. Um, my match on duty was again uh, Japan's versus Scotland. As you know, um, one of the most spectated uh, match as Japan was hit by the Typhoon Hajibis and it's almost a uh, risk of being cancelled. So I was there, I watched the environment and I was so overwhelmed when uh, we see uh, the moment of silence was introduced and when the Japanese anthem was being uh, sang, you can see tears coming down from everyone's eyes which truly a uh, memorable moment for me. And we had to work um, peace sites to oversee the process of uh, head injury assessment and exercise uh, the decision making to protect our player. Uh, of course, as a match day doctor, uh, I have to make sure the process, uh, the regulation is uh, based on the World Rugby uh, protocol and of course uh, the next quarterfinal when Japan plays South Africa I was again honored to be there as a match day doctor. So this um, moment was I'll be remembered for the rest of my life but I just want to say here that uh, in the Rugby World Cup last year I could feel the spirit of rugby values um, in instilling the integrity, passion, solidarity, discipline and respect uh, throughout the tournament. And for me, that is a true marker of the success of the story. And the thing is, uh, I didn't know you were involved in the Rugby World Cup until you came back after the whole tournament was over. Then you told me, hey, Rod, I was involved with the Rugby World Cup. I was like, what? <laughs> so that was that was, some, that was a shocker. But yeah, I, I'm still proud of you, bro. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lucy, you were involved with the Rugby World Cup uh, as well, right? Uh, for 2019. Were you involved as well before that? And what was your role in the Rugby World Cup? Uh, yes, so my role as a medical trainer was, was again to help. We worked um, we worked a lot with with Japan Rugby to help train up all their match day doctors, um, and also my my role was to to kind of coordinate um, Matsuo Yamada, who is Asia Rugby CMO and also was one of the medical leads for the the Rugby World Cup, um, was very very kindly managed to uh, arrange for some of the MedCom members to be able to um, attend as ob observers uh, and to give them the opportunity to work uh, during during a Rugby World Cup match. So I was lucky enough to to, to go along and to, to join that. Um, obviously, the, the the typhoon did did uh, interrupt things somewhat. Um, and I actually have a funny story from 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 that. At the, the same uh, time as 
Basra was preparing to go and be match day doctor, I was transferring across um, uh, Tokyo from one hotel to another hotel uh, during the typhoon. And when I arrived at the, the, the new hotel, I walked into the hotel and there was a, a very smart looking uniformed lady behind the desk and a very smart looking uniformed man. There was a lot of people waiting because they, they, they checked out, but they couldn't move out of the hotel and other people were waiting to move in. Anyway, I went up and very politely sort of said, oh, hello, good morning, hi, good day, mass, and whatever. And then my glasses were all steamed up. And uh, afterwards there was, a, there, was a, there was a silence and then there was a couple of, a, a bit of laughter from the people who were all gathered around and I, I realized that with all its technology in Japan I was actually talking to a robot so <laughs> I wasn't quite able to check in as I thought <laughs> uh, but a fantastic experience again absolutely fantastic and the World Rugby Medical Commission Conference which was linked with the Training and Education Conference also it was held in Fukuoka over that time again just brought everybody together. So you, you kind of all felt like part of the rugby family. And I think that was that was really um, important as well. And it, it was just a fantastic um, experience. I was lucky enough to work at the um, England Rugby World Cup as well. I worked as a, a medical room nurse there and uh, very different experiences. But, you know, it, it is just a fantastic experience to work at something like that. I, I, I agree with Asriel. It's, it's certainly very, very memorable. For sure. And uh, the, the thing is, uh, the uh, other panelists today uh, who are supposed to be here today, which is Dr. Tanushri Pillay, she was also involved with the Rugby World Cup. She can't be here today because she is having a baby. So all the best to her. And uh, we you know... Of, of, for, from all of us from Asia Rugby, we wish you all the best, uh, you know, in delivering your baby. And of course, congratulations uh, for, you know, winning the Rugby World Cup together with uh, the South African team, which is uh, truly a an inspiration to all people like, you know, Lucy and of course, Dr. Azriel, who is who are involved in this uh, area of, of the sport. Uh, of course, you guys also, if there's a uh, you know, some form of glory for, from the team. You guys will take that glory with you guys as well, right? So, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, we have a, a question from Facebook. Let us see the question. And from why I can't... And, uh, yeah, it's from our star guests uh, who, are, who always ask questions on the show, Mahfizul Islam, to Ben. Yeah, Ben, I think it's your... Your fan, you are working closely with unions. Do you think different social and religious views affects on player welfare? Wow. Okay. So, um, Rod, I think the first thing I, I just want to comment on, and um, thank you very much for congratulating South Africa on winning the World Cup. I could see that was quite difficult for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> So he's like, I could see like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, so <laughs> to get to to get back to to Mafisul's question, yes. I mean, we're talking about Asia, 30, 31 unions at the moment, you know, and it's it's so diverse from, you know, from Lebanon to Guam and Kazakhstan down to to Indonesia. Um, um, I would say yes, social and religious. Um, so, I think. Um, in, in, in terms of the of, of, of the social, we, we know on the one extreme end, we could could have a union where a male medic is is, is not allowed to um, to to treat female players, which um, could be perceived as a problem. But for me, it's not a problem. It's actually an opportunity to get more women out there to become um, first aiders or match day doctors and and so on. So. So in that sense, yes, it is diverse. I, I, I can understand that that um, sometimes in some countries it can be perceived as 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 um, not appropriate, and, and and that does put people off the off of rugby. So and, and it's it's a, it's again. I think most most of the times it's it's about it's about gender, um, and um, I would say uh, our. It's a, it, it will take us some time, but we need to get a concerted message, uh, effort to get the message out there that this game is more about just, it's not a dangerous game, firstly. Secondly, is we also need to look have a holistic look and say, um, it's not only about um, physical player welfare, it's, it's, it's about player welfare in general. 
So that's where the, the, the safeguarding comes in. And that's where we can actually coach people how to handle these situations where, where things could could be misinterpreted. Um, I don't know if I, if I answered the, the, the question, but I think, um, yes, I think in, ter in terms of our unions and getting safeguarding policies out there and doing safeguarding training, just to get people to understand, you know, that, that rugby is perceived differently. And when we want, when we talk about player welfare, um, yes, that we, we need to think holistic. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think, or, I think you did. Uh, I, I probably can talk a little bit more on the support that Asia Rugby provides in terms of, you know, this kind of education for the masses. Uh, how how yes. do you guys do that? Okay, so it's 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 become a, a strange part of our lives that we always talk about pre-COVID and post-COVID. So um, <laughs> I think let, let's just, let's just talk in 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 normal circumstances. Yes, um, there would be face-to-face -face, um, um, uh, courses delivered, um, which would be your your normal first aid in rugby and and so on, which is normally done by a trained medical educator um and the, and the and these are not focused only on on uh, dr azrael and, and, and lucy's job is not to train more doctors they're actually uh, training educators to go and make sure there's player welfare so um there's a first aid in rugby but if you if you just want to stay uh, be, be, become a coach and stay as a coach of course player welfare is part of that as well so for instance if you want to sign up for a level one course then of course you, you you can't just coach. You need to take in consideration um, things like concussion management of, of concussion and and and, and warm ups and so on. So um, just just to link on with with what Azrael said is you know this this although we stuck in you know in in our own countries our own communities and and so on. This is the ideal time for people to get out there, get online, and get to to. To go and, and and qualify themselves online through the concussion, through the through the the, the player welfare modules in, in in rugby ready and 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 yeah, even on 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 the strength and conditioning side, the World Rugby's rolled out a, a a program called Activate, which is which is which teaches coaches how to 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 do warm ups and strength and conditioning to prevent injuries. So um, yeah, it's quite a holistic approach, but all the stuff is online. So I would encourage people to to get online and do that. Once we get back to the face to face, that's when 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 our training and education specialists would would, would jump in and, um, and 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 train people. And then from our development side, as we always we, we always include the safeguarding as as part of our, our training. Um, and and I think that's also the union's job to make sure. That, that we, we, we take a holistic approach. Uh, Lucy, you know, you've been you've been uh, in around for, for quite some time in, in this uh, you know, particular uh, <laughs> issue. Probably you can um, comment on how can we get others to participate uh, in, in terms of first aid in, in rugby and stuff. Yeah, well, actually, so that, that's you've actually picked on my passion, really, because my, my, my real passion is to try to get people in the community interested. And I think as, as, as Ben said, we, we, we can't take doctors and nurses and, and make them into rugby medics. What we need to do is take rugby people and give them enough skills to be able to provide first aid, to be able to, to you know, to, 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 to look after player welfare, essentially. And there are a lot of people around who, who, who we're able to do that with. I think one of my, in, in Hong Kong, we have a, uh, a, a program that we've developed where we go to, 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 to teach first aid in schools and this helps the schools, it helps the students, they like to do this, it's, part one of, it's a life skill to learn first aid but on the back of that we say well come out and get some on-field experience, you know some real experience practicing your skills um, with, with the rugby and then from that it, we're able to, quite a few of the students have then come along and joined our volunteer medical team. And that's been fantastic. They then go on, um, if they're interested to become trainers and, and, and teach uh, the first aid programs, they also then help to recruit new members, etc. And so we've, we, we've really 
sort of managed to expand the team by uh, encouraging people to come to come along uh, to learn what it what it, I say essentially our life skills. And I think one of the areas where I've uh, there's a couple of areas where I've I've really seen that made it make a difference. One was quite a few years ago now when we went down to Laos to Laos Rugby um, Federation to run the first uh, little first aid programs down there and help to develop some first aiders there who then went on to develop more first aiders. And now they have a fantastic program that they've rolled out also in Vietnam um, in many other areas. And they, they've gone from really relying on outside help a lot to being able to manage their own rugby tournaments, even you know Asia-wide rugby tournaments with very, very little outside support, which is absolutely fantastic. And of course, these are skills they can take back to their villages, take back to work, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There's a and the other more local experience was one of the students from a school here about nine years ago. I did one of my first um, programs in in one of the schools here, and there were a couple of students that were really really enthusiastic about learning first aid. They then came out, um, helped with the rugby. They then helped to to expand our volunteer medical team by getting other people along. They trained. In fact, they came they came to Laos. With, with us as volunteers to help teach. Um, and the nice thing from that is they've, they've now gone on to run the volunteer medical team, but recently one of those uh, students has, has just qualified um, uh, as a registered nurse, which is absolutely fantastic. So it's really lovely to see that pathway um, happen in the community, because ultimately it, that's where we, we, we need to really gather more people uh, in order to support the game. Uh, ben, uh, uh, you yes, know, yes, right. Lucy was talking about. Lucy was talking about just now. Uh, you know, creating uh, the uh, asking people to participate and stuff. How about you? How do you? How do we get? Uh, you know, people to get involved with this ultimately uh, do they need to go for an online course or things like that like yeah. rugby ready yeah. do, do they do, do I, stuff like yeah. that i think um yes of course uh, what what lucy said you know it's 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 a continuous process um what what she mentioned about somebody who who started off and then ended up becoming a nurse which which is great i don't think i mean it doesn't it, you don't have to become a nurse but Bottom line is every team needs a medic. And I think that's 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 the starting point. And I think that should be from our side, from Asia Rugby, it's just a continuous process to say, what are you doing? You're, you're training a coach, you're training your, your match officials, but where are your first aiders? So I think in that sense, Asia Rugby is doing a pretty good job to to offer more courses. So people, if there's if there's a first aid in, in rugby course, people would would come up and, and sign up for that. So, um, but then on the other hand, these courses uh, don't come around very often. So I would say to somebody, if you, if, if you want to, to become a team, a team first aider, the first step is go and play on, to, on, on the World Rugby Passport side and have a look at, at, at all the modules, modules that you, that you can do online in preparation. So one day when the first aid and rugby course is coming around to your town or your region, sign up for that and then um you've, you've already done the the pre-course work which which is then good and and you, you know player welfare is not only about first aid it's it's also part of coaching and it's part of strength and conditioning and 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 so on so i would encourage people to do that but um just just to to mention something that that we can actually encourage players also to go onto the onto the online side um, I think a few years ago, and I, I guess it's still is the situation in in the UAE that it it was um, compulsory for all players in in leagues to actually do the online concussion um, um, module. And then you would say, but why? Do we, you know, the coaches are not the medics. But um, as we sometimes see, as if 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 all the players on the field understand the protocols with concussion, they would be the first ones to encourage one of their teammates to go off rather than to try to, to, to stay on the field and, and be, be the staggering hero. So um, it's continuous, but um, there's a lot of stuff that I would just say, to, if any young person, come on, please, we need, we need first aiders. Start the process now in COVID when, 
when when things are still a bit, a bit slow start with the online stuff oh that's great man and i think uh dr Azri, i want to ask you this question how important it is for you to for you to um, have an understudy, for you to have a protege, for you to train someone for the continuation, for probably to spread the awareness and also to spread the um, the uh, education about medical to to the masses. How important is it, Doc? Um, it is very, very important that we put effort into this process as you know that we have were dealing with uh, not just the physical things about the actual work, but we need to know how to showcase the work. So I believe the new generation now has opportunity to use a social media platform and the likes of online training and, and uh, promotion in order to get the awareness and the message across. Uh, I'm very lucky to work with the new doctors who help set up an Instagram account, for example, and also the new uh, team with the union that sets up uh, the platform for um, the union in terms of uh, online uh, information. So we would like to see more action, um, not just uh, on the ground, but on the cyber world so that everybody will be rich because everyone is using the handphones. All I can think about is there will be concussion apps, there will be first aid apps that can help uh, the new young people to be educated and engaged in the practical aspect of the play welfare. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to also take this opportunity to mention that um, in Asia Rugby Medical Com, um, we continuously uh, look through the competition uh, medical side of it in the form of uh, reviewing the Section 7 uh, medical arrangement manual uh, for the competition because the principle, the protocol, the important gist of the play welfare message is incorporated in the tournament manual. If the tournament manual require uh, traveling team to have a practitioner with a level one first aid, level two immediate care in rugby, that will also encourage people and union to organize activities to train more people. And we hope that we do not want to underestimate uh, the uh, level one because they, they will need them more at the ground level. So the more level one first aider they are, the better the system going to be. And in fact, some of the area will be log logistically challenging to have a full-time doctors uh, on the beach. So you rely on the first aiders to support the play welfare overall. And I agree with Ben and Lucy, everyone should be on board, especially the players and the coaches. And we save a lot of time uh, when these important people are part of the team. Uh, do not forget the spectators, the parents, the sponsors, and the fans. Uh, let them in to our work in terms of player welfare uh, management. Cool. Thank you very much, Dr. Azir. And after this, I'm coming to you so that you can certify me to be the level one first aider. Okay? So, <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send some of my rugby boys from the club to join in and you know, to be certified as well. And probably uh, level two, who knows, in the future. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you very much. Uh, you guys have been great. Lucy, Dr. thank you Rod. for you know, sharing your experiences. Ben, thank you very much for that. You uh, you, know, you, you know what? I can I can ask you anything. You can answer just everything, right? You, <laughs> you just won't say no. <laughs> so, cool. And okay, so Azriel, as, of course, Azriel, you will... in, in a few years' time, Dr. Rod. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Wow, wow, that, uh, seven years of education. Yeah, probably, who knows? You never know, right? Anyway, guys, thank you very much for being with us on Asia Rugby Live. Uh, you guys have been great and hope to see you guys soon in the future. And thank you, everyone who has been joining us on Asia Rugby Live. And of course, this has this show has been an informative and also a, a great um, session of education for everyone, uh, definitely. Uh, 
Uh, see you guys in the next episode of Asian Rugby Live. I brought. Till then, see you again.